nice to see you. I hope you're doing all right this morning. Um, I just wanted to uh, give you another little rumble from Sinclair Ferguson's excellent Lent book, To Seek and Save the Lost. I wonder if you've ever had one of those um, second glance type moments. You're uh, driving along, or in my case, perhaps you're on your bike, and you walk past them, or you see them out of the corner of your eye, you, you, you drive past them, uh, and it, without even thinking about it, your head just whips round, uh, and you try and see, was that really so-and-so? It looked exactly like them. You're, you're wondering, was that them? And then you have to concentrate again on where you're cycling, or, uh, where you're driving to, so that you don't have a, have a crash. But you're caught up with the idea, was that really the person I think it was? All the way through the Bible, uh, people and characters um, turn up and they are often imperfect foretastes of the Lord Jesus, God's long promised rescuer. Uh, and we're introduced to them all the way through the, the, the Bible so that when Jesus turns up, his people are ready to welcome him uh, as the king that God had promised. Sinclair Ferguson, in yesterday's reading, did a brilliant job of introducing us uh, um, to some of the ways in which those patterns work in the scriptures. Uh, it was the story of the, um, the triumphal entry into, Jesus, uh, into Jerusalem for Jesus, uh, Luke chapter 19. Um, we normally remember the story at, at um, uh, Palm Sunday, you know the one, donkeys and palms and crowd singing and hosannas and hallelujahs and all of those sorts of things. Well, um, in it, we're shown Jesus as God's long promised king. Um, and the, the crowd sing, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a, um, a part of the book of Psalms that they're singing there. Uh, and the crowds are just filled with joy and praise as they, uh, as they welcome Jesus as God's king. But what's actually happening uh, it is that some of the crowd, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are appalled because they know exactly what's happening as God, uh, as Jesus rides in, and the crowds acclaim him as God's king. And they they say, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. You mustn't do that. The kingly theme carries on as Jesus makes his way up to Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And in so doing, Ferguson helps, helps us to see that's exactly what King David did when Jerusalem rebelled against him uh, and tried to make his son Absalom king. He wept over the hard heartedness and the rebelliousness of his people. And in so doing, um, King David was getting us ready for uh, the, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus, the one whom people would not just reject, but would put to death on a cross. And all of the prophets that had gone before um, Jesus's time, all of those messengers who had spoken what the Lord was saying were to get us ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus and for his message. Coming not as one who spoke the message of God, but coming as the message of God, the word made flesh. And then you get that lovely thing. If, you, if the word makes made flesh comes to you and he begins to speak God's word to you, uh, verse 48 of Luke chapter 19 says um, uh, all the people were hanging on his words. It's a great description, isn't it, of just the power of the Lord Jesus' teaching. We probably shouldn't be surprised. Lastly, uh, Ferguson points out as Jesus goes into the temple, as he drives out uh, the money changers, um, the people who are using this place of prayer for profit, as he gets rid of them, what he's doing is he's showing himself to be um, the true priest. He's restoring right worship to God's place and booting out the, um, uh, the people who are just interested in making a buck or two. So those three ways of identifying Jesus and his work are known as the threefold office of Jesus. He's depicted as prophet, priest and king. And as you read through the rest of the Bible, keep your eyes open. Your eyes open for the prophets, the Elijahs, the Moses, the Isaiahs, the Ezekiels, the Jeremiahs, all of whom herald God's word and all of whom are preparing us for the coming of Jesus. Look out for the priests, the people who make God's people right with him through the offering of sacrifices. Obviously, 
Uh, you can think of people like Samuel, I guess, would be the, the one who comes to mind. Um, and keep an eye out uh, for the kings who should rightly lead God's people in the worship of the Lord. Um, they all do that imperfectly. None of these people are perfect, but all of them uh, will fill in, if you like, shade in some background uh, for the Lord Jesus when he comes. So that when we see him, we should have one of those, ah, I've seen that before type moments. And then as you read the rest of Jesus' life, you'll see these things popping up right, left and centre. I'd never seen the thing about how Jesus was able to ride uh, on a donkey, which no one else had ever ridden on, in the midst of a street party and it not go completely mad. It was because just as the first Adam, who'd been given responsibility over the animals, you'll remember Adam in the garden, uh, the Lord brings the animals to Adam and he names them all, establishing his authority, his role in caring for and protecting creation. Just as he'd fallen through sin and therefore the relationship between creatures and uh, God's king-like representative Adam had been ruined. So here was Jesus, the second Adam, and he comes to restore creation by dying for sin. One of the things I love about the scriptures is there's always more to see. Have a really good day.